Today's guest started a business that he grew to 35 staff. It won the highest industry award in the country and it comfortably put his kids through private school. (laughs) But he hated it. So he sold it and started a business that has him totally on purpose doing something he loves. It's a very driven episode 494 of the award-winning small business Big Marketing Podcast. Yeah, I said, welcome to a small business marketing show, where successful small business owners share their souls. To take your marketing straight to the lead, now here's your host, Mr. Tim Bowie. And welcome back to your weekly dose of marketing reflections. I'm your host, Tim Bowie Reed, you are infinitely more importantly, you're a motivated business owner and you are so, so ready to crank out some great marketing to build that beautiful business of yours into the empire it deserves to be. And if that's not enough and you are itching to fast track your marketing, then let's get personal. Just you and me with a one-on-one coaching session, which you can book over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Big episode today. Long-time listener and founder of This Is My Life, that's the business name, Tony Knight joins us to share how he's built a business that has him bouncing out of bed each and every day. And who doesn't want a bit of that? This week's Monster Prize Draw winner spent $100 and got $10,000 of business in return. Plus, I'll let you in on next week's guest who went from the slums of Venezuela to creating a multi-million dollar business selling something insanely boring. As per usual, team, there is marketing G-O-L-D dripping from the ceiling over here at Small Business Big Marketing's HQ. So let's get stuck right in. Now, a few years back, Tony Knight sold his graphic design business, which at its peak employed 35 staff from 28 cultures. It put a very nice roof over his head and put all his kids through private school. But guess what? In his own words, he hated it. As he neared his 50th birthday, he decided to sell it and pursue an idea he'd had floating around his head for a long time. To start a business called This Is My Life and document the life stories of loved ones in film and print. He now does something he absolutely loves. He's never felt so on purpose and he's created a service that is very much in high demand and he's about to explain exactly how he's done it. By the way, if you've just lost someone close to you, then this chat may act as a trigger, so please listen at your own discretion. I started off by asking Tony to reflect back on the time when he was building a business he hated. Okay, well, uh, graphic design was just one of the businesses I'd I'd actually purchased. Um, It was actually a printing company, and we had graphic design, and I offered photography as well on the side, but Mm -hmm. that was the smallest component, the only part I enjoyed. But I actually, uh, if I go back a little bit further, I started at 15 years old. I did an apprenticeship in printing, and the only reason I did that was because it was at a what I thought was a newspaper, Mm-hmm. And I couldn't get a job in photography. I was 15. I looked like I was 10. No one would give me a job, except I was getting images on the front page of all the local newspapers and stuff, but they wouldn't take me serious when they saw me. Mm-hmm. So I got a job at this printing place that uh, I thought was a newspaper. And a few weeks in, I said, so uh, when do we print the newspaper? And they said, we haven't done one since about 1941. Naive and whatever. And I thought, oh, well, it's given me income. I might as well get a trade behind me and I did it. I was glad to be out of school, finished the apprenticeship, and the first job I was offered outside of that that company was to actually run a a printing company. And I had a lot of skills that I'd learnt over the years at that previous company. So I ran this place and he said to me, after 12 months, if you can make this place break even. It's yours. Well, he said, I'll give you 50%. And I thought, my God, this is a great opportunity. I worked my butt off. I was doing seven days a week. I was doing 100, 110 hours a week. At the end of 12 months, he calls me in and he says, well, we've got some good news, we've got bad news. I said, what's the good news? He said, well, I'll give you the bad news first. He said, we haven't broken even. I was gutted. Mm -hmm. 
And he said, the good news is, though, we made a profit, sort of all confused. <laughs> What's going on? He said, well, look, um, I'm happy with everything the way it's going. And if you keep this up, before you know it, you'll be giving you some shares. And I said, well, the, the handshake arrangement was 50%. And he then just looked at me and said, you didn't think I was serious. Well, that was my first lesson in business. Get everything in writing. I left and... Uh, Within a week, I left, actually. He ended up selling all the pieces off because he couldn't get someone else that could do all the things. Mm -hmm. And I bought a machine. I started running it on the side. I, I went and worked for other companies, and I was doing everything from graphic design to printing to estimating And because um, I obviously tuned a lot more skill set up. And then I, um, I had an opportunity. I got a big contract from Cadbury Sweeps, and I'd gone from having this little machine uh, which was, I think it cost me $1,500. And I was doing about 35, 40 grand a year out of it, uh, which was about 90% profit back then, to getting a contract that was worth, I think it was about 1.2 million. Um, so I suddenly had the gear up. And I don't know, when I look back now, I actually don't even know how I got all the equipment, but somehow I used powers of persuasion to. Uh, to get mm. machinery without having assets behind me and bricks and mortar. And I dropped about $900,000 worth of equipment on the floor in a space of about a month, yeah. geared up. And 28 years later, I, you know, I mean, it was a, a, a really good company. We had a great reputation. Well, it was clearly good to you, but it, but you know, it, it was something that it, it almost sounds like it happened by default. You didn't plan to build it. And then once you build yeah. it, it was like, this is not actually what I wanted to do with my life, and uh, mm. you ended up hating exactly. it. So, yeah. I, I know that you said you, you, you had trouble coming to terms with selling it, but once you put it on the market, it sold in a week. Yeah, that's what shocked me. <laughs> I actually tried to sell it on yeah. the quiet overseas, and you know they're saying, "Oh, the South Africans and the Indian market, and the Chinese market, they you know they'll pay big dollars for this." We were only doing six to eight million dollars a year, but we were very profitable. In fact, when I was turning over four million, we made a million dollars of clear profit. Yeah. And, you know, in that industry, that was unheard of. So I think we had a, a good company to sell and it ticked a lot of boxes, but it wasn't big enough for overseas people. So two years has gone around with me having this on the market, so to speak, and then I got shafted, to be honest, by a, a senior rep. And that was uh, the turning point for me. I thought, no, I, I just haven't got enough wind in my sails to do this again he ripped a couple of million out of the business and oh, tight. so another hard lesson learned because uh, we were yeah. literally about to sign contracts so he have, have you learned some lessons yet you've been shafted twice they say things happen in three what's going on i tend to trust people unfortunately you know i still live by the rule of a man's handshake is his contract and it's his it's his yeah. firm bond but uh, and i still live by that anyway the long and short of it was i said to my wife I can't do this. My blood pressure was in stroke range. It was like 216 mm. over 150 something. Oh, that's, if you talk to a doctor, they'll tell you I should be in hospital. But um, right. I was feeling like I was on death's door. So, Tony, you, you, okay, so you get rid of the business. Yeah. Awesome. You got some dough in the bank. Now it's time yep. to do what you yep. were put on this earth to do, which is what we're here to talk about today. The business is yep. called This Is My Life. Before we get into that, I'm interested, what would your advice be to business owners listening who hate what they're doing, but it's mm. providing a lifestyle, an income, whatever it may be? Yeah. Um, for me, the lesson I've learned, and I, I tell people this all the time, is don't wait. Just do it, as Nike says. Just do mm -hmm. it. If you've got a gut feeling, just go with it. And as Steve Jobs said, you can only really count the, I mean, join the dots looking backwards, not forwards. I live by that rule because now I look back, I think oh, I had to learn some lessons. I had to build up a bit of equity. I had to do all these things. And I wish I'd done it years earlier because I would have, in my opinion, been a lot better off. I certainly would have been worth a lot more money. And I wouldn't have, I guess, uh, had to do it as hard as I did do it. But in saying that, I threw everything into this new business, like literally everything. What do you say to business owners who are now saying, uh, listening to you and going, yeah, but he, he, he'd sold his business. He had some dough in the bank, a bit of runway, mm. as they call it in the startup world. And yep. uh, he had room to fail. What if, you did, what if you don't have any dough in the bank? I would say 
for starters, that's actually not correct because I did have dough in the bank, but that rep cost me close on $400,000 in yeah, right. legal fees, which was followed up by someone else shafting me for a quarter million. And that certainly put a strain on it. Look, I, I, I admit I had properties and all sorts of things I'd accumulated, but you don't want to go and sell off everything. Um, so I, I treated it as a startup with very minimal money. In fact, I built the, uh, the actual building I, I purchased through my super fund, but I did the fit out myself personally to save money. I, everywhere I could save a dollar, I treated it like I did when I started my old company mm. in that I literally did as much as I could to save a dollar. And I'm lucky, I'm, I'm fairly skilled in a lot of areas, so I can, you know, do carpentry, wiring, and or I shouldn't say wiring, I'll get told off. Okay, so so you've sold this graphic design yep. business. Um, at what, how long after that did the idea for This Is My Life, which is your current business, come to fruition? How, how quickly did you get it to market? Actually, the idea was um, really first born after my mum passed away, which is about 18, 19 years ago now. In fact, I think the very first inkling of it was when my dad died, which was in the first year of business, Because, uh, but it was certainly reinforced. When my mum passed away, she, I mean, my dad died at 57. My mother died when she was in her mid-60s. And when she, uh, I was the executive of the will, and I ended up with all these resources from her, you know, to try and distribute and she wasn't a wealthy woman, she was a pensioner, but I'm talking about the old photos. It was literally shoeboxes of, of image. I would not have a clue who half these people were. In fact, probably 90%. And I thought, you know what, I've got nothing here. What do you do? Do you throw them out? Really, it would be a great thing to have a great resource that tells me who these people are, the dates, the times, and I can sort of see a bit of my, my history. But the one thing that I miss the most, and this is where I say it goes back to my dad, is I miss the sound of my dad's voice. And I've got nothing at all with his voice because mm. back in those days, uh, you know, there was no iPhones and all this. And our movie camera we had was a standard eight film camera, which didn't have any microphones. So I can still hear him in my head, but I would just love to have what I produce now for my clients. I'd love to have that and sh- share it with my kids. I explain what you are producing. What is this? What are the out? What are the key outputs of if I was a a client yep. of this is my life? I'll, I'll give you my elevator pitch <laughs> as I've love learned it. in your podcast. So if I'm in the elevator, I say, like, imagine tonight going home, sitting on the couch with your family, and instead of watching Gogglebox or something else, that's rubbish sorry i shouldn't say that but instead of watching uh just normal tv you watch a an interview of your parents or grandparents and as they talk about their life's journey all their old photos bits of old home movie snip up to you know come up to sort of show you visually part of their life and you get a really good understanding of them in their own words that you know you feel like there's a, certainly it's a whole legacy i'm going to get you to pitch me again because I okay. reckon you were tripping over your own tongue. You and I have just hopped in an elevator. Yep. I've gone, geez, mate, you look like an interesting fellow. What do you do? Yeah. Okay. I, I can hear it. You're going, for, you're going for the paper. You've, you've got it written yeah. down somewhere. No, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm now looking at the paper to say uh, what have I got written down. That's good, uh, mate. I, I, like, I love the fact that you have gone to the effort. Many don't. I've... Um, of creating an elevator pitch. Jeez, a bit noisy yeah. in the background. Are you writing as we go, are you? No, no, I've just dumped that paper now. So <laughs> my, my, do you want my elevator pitch now? I would love it. Okay. So imagine tonight going home, go home tonight and sit with your family and watching your parents and grandparents on your own TV telling their story in their own words. And as they talk, all their old photos and snippets of home movies appear to help join the dots. It doesn't stop there, though. When someone, I get a, a raised eyebrow and I go, and then to top it off, I said, everything that's in that movie, all the old photos that we've restored and all that, go into an album, and you've got to see this album to really believe it. It's archival. It's it's designed to last 118 years, technically, odd figure. But it's got all your old photos, and every one of those photos has got a description, a date if it's possible. We've got the family tree in there, and it becomes your family's legacy about your history and the movie is in blu-ray dvd usb ipod versions everything is all loaded there to try and make it future proof 
Yeah, and that normally yeah. they go, what a great idea. Absolute no-brainer to me. And, and Tone, I think one of the, the magical parts of this is you are not producing these after the person's passed away. You're actually producing no. them mm. while they're alive and getting that that person to provide some kind of commentary. Do you interview yes. them? How does that come about? Okay, so I've got a purpose-built studio here in Victoria and we usually film them here because we can control sound and light and all that, but there are... We do often do it in people's homes, um, especially those that are terminally ill because we've done quite a few of them. So we have a lot of preparation first. We get to know a little bit about the person we're filming or persons. Uh, they'll give us all their, their key points that they want to get out and that then we also build from that and get all their old photos and anything that's, that we can to try and help piece the story together. So before we actually start the interview we've got a timeline built as to how the interview is going to be conducted. We've got the photos. So I'll bring you in. So if you're my client, Tim, I, I'd get you in. You might be talking about Rubbish. your life. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. no, you, I do want to interview you. I reckon you'd have a fascinating story. But um, we'd have as much information on you as we can. And as you're talking, like we're prompting you, but we ask the questions in such a way that if it is an individual, our voice is never heard. And we're mm. never seen. So we have a way of uh, creating this story with, without the need for a, an interviewer. Yeah. I call that the Jamie Oliver School of Video Production because Jamie, uh, anytime you see him, it looks like he's talking. He's always talking to someone just to left left of camera. And um, it's a really right. good video, tip, actually, for anyone who's wanting to produce video uh, and a bit scared of looking down the barrel of a camera. Having someone right. behind the camera asking questions um, and then editing them out is, is yeah, good. that's that's correct. I actually sit behind the main camera. We use anything up to four cameras when we're filming, just to get the different angles so we can cut and get the real close-ups for the tear jerks and all the rest of it. That's a beautiful story. We're chatting with uh, this is your life's founder. Tony Knight, who now does what he absolutely loves, and uh, that's an awesome story. Do you go to work now, just full of joy and excitement? I, I don't. I don't work anymore. You don't work. It's no. You no, don't have a job anymore. No, it's got a, a, no. A, a hobby that pays you good money. I always say that the best day at my old business. My, sorry, I'll say that again. The worst day here is better than the best day there at my old job. Oh, that's awesome. And you know, I do work seven days a week because I love it. My wife hates the fact I work so much, but uh, <laughs> there's, it's exciting. Tony, I imagine you've had a whole lot of moments that have changed your outlook on life. You talked at the start about the fact that, you know, the way we go about our lives these days mm. is probably, you know, not as great thanks to unsocial media. But yeah, maybe recount a couple of moments with clients where you could hear a pin drop. Mm. Well, quite diverse. Like some of them are just interesting it's not the pin drop sessions but i find them still fascinating like old ralph um i shouldn't say old ralph he's 101 at the moment we've become mates now as i tend to do with a lot of clients because when you get to know their story you really have a, a much greater appreciation to, about the person and what they've been through now ralph's had a, a fantastic life he says he lived through the war volunteered when the war broke out it, every time i speak to him he tells me another story he hasn't got in his video but he would talk about uh you know comparisons like he said uh, his old car when he got his first car and borrowed a few pounds from his parents and he said every weekend you'd be checking the fluids in it you'd be checking the pressures in the air and when the brakes needed doing you didn't take it to a garage you actually relined the brakes yourself and you pulled out mm -hmm. the manual and you learned how to do it and it, he then told me how he went down this long hill and car didn't have any brakes and had a smash but he said now he said he can't tell me the last time he lifted the bonnet on his car and he was driving up until just recently but he said now he goes to a car wash and they they wash it he said he goes to the garage and they service it and he said he wouldn't know what's under the bonnet now it's just mm -hmm. interesting comparisons but uh, then there's uh, the funny moments like another one of our favorite clients a chap called roger him and his wife we filmed and um, she would say, tell them about the pigeons. I mean, oh, this would be interesting. And he used to get catch these pigeons in the, the bell tower at some local church or something and he'd take them down to the local market here in Victoria and he'd sell them. And then the next week 
the pigeons would fly home to him <laughs> and he'd sell them again. He said, <laughs> I used to sell the same people quite often up to four times the same pigeons they were oh, buying. Dude. And th- so they're the sort of the funny moments, but then the, the stuff that always puts a lump in my throat, and this has happened, I kid you not, three separate times. We've filmed people who have unfortunately been terminal. One in particular, he had a couple of daughters. They were absolute best friends, but they were squabbling when we were filming and uh, he actually told me that it was really cutting him up. And he had to keep, he was going through chemo at the time, so he kept, we had to do his sessions in like an hour. He'd go and have a rest. He'd come out and do another hour. So in one of those breaks, I got the two girls on the couch. I said, can you just put your stuff aside and and just literally uh, reflect on what, you know, some of the moments with your, your parents and your dad specifically. And they were touching each other. They were, you know, like best mates. They're just... You, you wouldn't think there was anything going on between them as in a, a, any sort of friction. And it was authentic. It was real and didn't tell any of them that we were putting this in. So it was the last chapter. Uh, so we finished off his movie and I put this as a closer. And I do this with a lot of people when their parents um, or parent has unfortunately got a terminal illness. The This chap, I won't mention names obviously for privacy, no, no. but... Um, he, only uh, a very short time after we finished all this and we've delivered the project and he hadn't actually seen it because of one reason or another. The rest of the family had and he had gone into the hospice, you know, for the final sort of days and he asked if he could see the movie and they took in a laptop and they gave him headphones and they said for that hour he was smiling, he was crying. I mean, he's seen his whole life coming out in this, I think is a really magical movie. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it's got music in there as well, so it's quite emotional. Mm-hmm. But she said the, the look on my father's face was absolutely priceless. And she said, then that last scene you put in, Tony, we forgot about that. And she said it was incredible because he was just beaming. And then the last thing he sees is, we love you, Dad is when they look straight down the barrel of the camera and it fades out and he flatlines. So I get, I get um, a bit choked up when I say that because... Mate, you got me choked up. <laughs> I've, this has happened to me, uh, you know, on a few occasions and uh, mm. Mm. you certainly never get sick of hearing it because she said to me, I, I just can't describe how happy you have made my father mm. and his final moments to see us telling him that we love him and the way it was done with all the emotions, you said, it, it is just something you cannot put a price on. I do put a price on it, you know, but that's the business side of me coming out. But in all honesty, it, it is priceless, you know. Tone, let's talk about the business side yep. of This Is Your Life. How did you get your first couple of clients? Well, I have to contribute that to my lovely wife. Um, as soon as I told her she was in full support of the business, you know, and we were talking about marketing and so forth. And I hadn't actually discovered your podcast at this stage because this was, uh, I don't even know if you were going seven years ago. I was, mate. I've been, I'm, I'm 10 years old. <laughs> oh, sorry. Well, I, I, I did. Once I got onto yours, I started listening to the back catalogue. I've worked with marketing companies and big agencies mm-hmm. for many, many years with the printing business. So I had picked up quite a bit during that time on mm-hmm. the best way. And, of course, it's all changed now. It's all, you know, the way we market now is uh, completely different to how we marketed five yes. years ago, ten years ago. So my wife just approached a few people that she felt had really interesting stories and I said, look, I'd, I'll do these uh, a little bit less cost to try and get them on board so I've got some samples to show people. But it wasn't a, They would have paid the full price. It was never about saving money for those people that did it. But we got the first few that way and, like, she still, she bumps into people in the street. They, there's a bit of signage on the car and they say, what's this all about? That still continues to bring in clients. So never underestimate the value of, of actually just having signs on the car, uh, especially if you've got a, a curious name like This Is My Life, raises people's awareness and they go, you know, curiosity. And they'll, they look on the website. We see, you know, the hits going up and down when I look at the analytics. But, yeah, my lovely wife, Shelley, she... Um, she got the, the first few clients and never, ever lets me forget that. 
Is it, a, is it a very scalable? I want to talk about other ways you're marketing them because I know using social media and YouTube and referrals, I want to talk about that in a minute. Is it very scalable? Because it feels like absolutely once once you – well, do you, have you got a lot of staff out there? Because I imagine once you've got a, a job going, mm. you're immersed in it or have you got a whole mm. – have you got production crews all over the place? No, what uh, I've done – to date, I've handled them all with the crews that I've put together from Victoria. So we – and this is the beauty of this industry is – you can use freelancers. You don't need to hire full-time staff. Most of the, the best people are actually uh, subcontractors. You know, I've got people who are skilled in all different areas. So depending on the type of story as well, um, I might bring in someone else. So the, the biggest story that we ever covered was for a, a group in Perth. And on that one, never underestimate the power of SEO because – He said when he started searching, I came up as number one in all the search fields, no matter what he was searching for in terms of family legacy, um, you know, all of the the terms I'm trying to rank for. Mm. Uh, And he saw one of my clips and he said, that's it. He just rang me. And it was a Sunday afternoon. And who'd be working on a Sunday except for me? And he just started chatting to me. And he's telling me that how he's got his own film crew coming in and He's got a uh, cousin who's a big-time movie director from the States who's putting it all together, but they just wanted someone to edit it. And then after we got chatting and I spoke to his cousin who who was a, a big-time movie editor, uh, director, did work with Red Bull and all these big names over uh, in the States, mm-hmm. he said, look, you're a specialist in this area. I would rather just hand this over to you. So we just took over the whole project. Um, in terms of money, I, I will talk about what I charge, but um, that one in particular was way north of $100,000. Wow. Quite a lot more. All on the Sunday afternoon. Well, yeah, I, I just, you know, so that was my SEO money well spent. Talk, let's talk about that SEO. You're saying you're ranking well for, for all those terms. And, you know, I'm yeah. thinking, what terms do you rank well for? You mentioned family legacy. Yeah. What are you What are you actually doing? Are you paying, dare I ask, an SEO agency somewhere overseas or are you just creating great content? Mm, no. I did at the start I because I wasn't sure what to do at the start. And, uh, and I'll attribute a lot of this to your podcast because it gives you the courage to take a lot of these things on yourself when you actually break things down and, and put things in boxes and go, okay, I can tackle this mm-hmm. component. I had SEO experts, so to speak, and I mm-hmm. use that very loosely because 99% of them aren't. Jason McDonald, one of the claimed original founders of the web, I did his um, course online sort of thing, uh, you know, and he just – goes through the basics of what you should do. A lot of those things worked. I took it. A, I took my SEO away from uh, my expert. I was paying him originally. Oh god! At the start, it was like six grand a month. Oh, tone. for the first ninety days. So there was eighteen grand written off. That included the building of the site, uh, and then it dropped down to a maintenance fee of like twelve hundred. And I did that for nearly two years. But he kept giving me excuses saying the problem is trying to get you to rank is you don't exist. I said, what do you mean? He said, there's no businesses we can compare you to because I had no competition. There was not one company in Australia doing what I did. There's people who will do a movie. I would have thought that would be a reason to rank easily. Yeah, well, that's what I figured out in the end as well. There was a few people doing bits. So what are you doing? What are you doing now? Well, I've done all the SEO myself. So what I did was um, I looked at overseas as well. There was a guy in America that was doing the movies, but they weren't doing the albums. So I actually contacted him rather than just try and, you know, steal everything from him like most people do. I just contacted him. He told me what he was doing, and then I basically copied and pasted all his keywords into my website. I do simple things like make sure that, I'm on all the other social platforms because they all point back, of course. I was at the, I haven't done it for a while. I'm slapped myself on the wrist, but um, I was keeping the content moving all the time. Video always uh, connects better, obviously, than uh, anything static and especially words. Videos were getting a little bit of traction just doing snippets. So it was just a combination of, you know, probably 10 or 12 different bits and pieces. I was even running the free ads on called Gumtree. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I never wanted to sell anything through Gumtree, mm. but 
it's another search engine that can point back to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, all those, all those directories, whether it be Yellow Pages or Gumtree yeah, or any exactly. directory, you know, Yelp, any directory that gives you a free listing, take it. Well, Gumtree... Gumtree is now owned by eBay, and eBay is a huge yep. search engine. Well, there's authority attached to those sites, so anything pointing mm. back from those sites to your website has got to be a good thing. So, Tone, um, you, you have so you are scale. It is scalable, as you say. You've got freelancers. You, you, it's not just you. You can actually build something rather large out of this if you choose to. I believe so. What's the yeah. best marketing that you have done to generate new clients? Well, I can tell you. One of the worst first, and then I'll tell you the best. The worst is Shelley and I basically went on the road and we were telling the story to all of the, um, uh, like, probus groups, uh, oh, yeah. any sort of senior groups because we just thought there our people were filming. So we go out with a uh, keynote presentation and I suddenly had to learn how to speak in public and that was one of my greatest fears. When I get started, because I'm so passionate about it, it just flowed. Mm -hmm. And everyone was, oh, this is fantastic, and yeah, we love this, but never amounted to bums on seats. We get, oh God, I reckon at one stage we did some analytics, and we must have spoken to, I think it was a period of a couple of months. We we know we'd spoken to nearly ten thousand different people, and we got two clients out of it. Can I can I have a guess as to why that was the case? Is it because yeah. the the actual star of your show of the film yeah. is not is not your client? It's their family members. That's why you're the marketing expert. Now, why didn't I talk to you at the start? I don't know. I don't know. You are now. For a, <laughs> I, I'd like to think of myself as a reasonably intelligent sort of guy, <laughs> and you wouldn't think I was that dumb, but uh, I was right. because okay. we just figured our client that we're filming is the one who would pay for it. And that is the case for quite a few of them, but the majority of them is paid for by their siblings or at least started that way. One of the best things I did, so the opposite of that is I got a PR guy. I paid the bucks, engaged him for a few months. He got me on to like 3AW Radio down here in Melbourne, which is the biggest talkback radio in Victoria. And they got me a, a gig on a Saturday talking to uh, Grubby and Dee Dee. They have a, a, a great talkback show and I just went on and I was allocated, I think they said 12 minutes or something, uh, and that included a couple of ad breaks. Well, we went on for half an hour and I look at the clock thinking they're going to throw me out, but they go, no, this is fantastic and the calls were coming in and all this sort of stuff. I, the phone started ringing after that, so he didn't get me many of those gigs, but that certainly was... Uh, produce more clients from a single um, mm -hmm. oh, so called exercise than anything else. One lady rings me and she says, I've just heard you on the radio. She only picked up half of it, but she said, um, looking for something to give to my dad who's got absolutely everything. Uh, he's into genealogy. Do you do vouchers? Sure do. Hadn't done one before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but obviously know a bit about graphic design and printing, so... I said, oh, look, I'm just on the way back to the studio now. Can I give you a call back? And she said, yep. I rang her back. And I went through the, all the different packages we have and she gave me a credit card over the phone uh, because I think being on radio gave me that Bit of credibility and social proof, you know, because, um, you know, they're obviously a great show and it's a great radio show, that station. Um, so she felt comfortable handing over the, the card and I – Ashley said, look, I'd like to obviously meet with your, your dad. Well, he's gone on to be one of the great ambassadors. He actually said he felt so indebted to us for what we produce for him. Mm. He now tells everyone about it and oh. he's an official ambassador. But he not only did the story of his life with his first wife who unfortunately passed away with cancer, but he also then went on to do a second chapter with his wife that he's had for the last 18 years and it's it's almost a travel documentary because he's, he's been everywhere yeah, right. uh, but he ordered albums for the grandkids albums for his kids tone you know that yeah. um the thread the the, the p the pr strategy genius mm. absolutely yeah. you know getting you on 3aw 
on the Grubby and DD show on a Saturday afternoon. I know that show. I know those guys yeah. are genius. Um, it, clearly it worked for you. Um, the fact that they extended the 12 minutes to half an hour speaks volumes about the fact that you have mm. a product or a, or a story that is ideal for their audience. It's easy to talk about. Yeah. Did you, and I, I, I very, I'm always hesitant about suggesting advertising, above the line advertising as we call it, radio, TV, mm. newspapers, that kind of stuff. Did you consider uh, maybe buying an advertising schedule on 3AW? I certainly did, and I'll be blunt, at the time, and again, this is probably a mistake, I was just so busy with work I'd got from that, I just thought, you know, let's ride this way, but that's the best time to market. Absolutely. Of course, when you are busy. You're at the problem. Yeah, and so later down the track, we looked at 3AW, and we also looked at another uh, radio station called Light FM, and big difference in price, but huge difference big. in the returns. Mm. Um and I thought, you know, the old test and measure, let's get it right first. So I thought I'd start with Light FM. They still had a, a fairly big audience. And they also went on, I think, on the Channel 9 News or something, and they um, did it every night. Uh, they would cross to, I think it was Channel 9. Anyway, long and short of it was. Yeah, it, it is. Did all that sort of stuff. Um, Waste of time. Absolute. Sorry, mm. no disrespect to Light FM. Really good <laughs> bunch of people, but never got a single client. What I think you've done there, it, you know, incorrectly, should have called me, mate, but, I, you know, yeah. I think you've gone and had a great experience on 3AW and then you've extrapolated that experience to say, mm. oh, well, radio, radio generally as a medium is going to work for my business. Clearly not. I mean, Light FM, um, yeah, they have connections with Channel 9, be infinitely cheaper, but yeah. it's one of those things where you get what you pay for. Yeah, it might be, I mean, yeah, I think it's worth considering. I'd go back to an old episode I did with a fellow Dan Presser Oh, yeah, I remember Dan Presser. Yeah, listen to him, and he writes his own ads and has grandma and all that. Absolutely, and and I think what was really interesting about Dan, and for listeners who haven't listened to that episode, this is a fellow who sells um, a, prune, a Sun Razor prune juice. Can you believe it? Mm -hmm. He he sells it on three AW with what I would call, and we we both agreed at the time, both Dan and I, these are cringe worthy ads. Absolutely, uh, they work. They <laughs> work their pants off. They're incredibly mm -hmm. memorable. He appears in them, and I just think it's a really interesting creative strategy. And again, depending yeah. on how far you want to take the. Uh, this is your life business, that would be a, a pretty interesting strategy. Not a cheap mm. one. And the problem, I'm always hesitant around radio advertising and those things is because, you know, the ad runs and then you've got to find another amount of dough to run more ads. But if you can crack the code of spending a dollar and getting two back, then you're going to keep finding dollars, right? Yeah. Well, in hindsight, I think the code for me would have been off the back of that interview would be to have started running ads with AW at that time because I had the credibility of being interviewed and then followed up with ads. Going back six months later, oh, probably two to three years ago now. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty loyal audience. They may, may or may yeah. not remember you. Oh, look, you know, they might have me back on. I've, I've kept in touch with them and, um, and I certainly know that um, there was a lot of people were ringing and the phone rang off the uh, hook that day with people trying to ring in. Tony, one of the things I love uh, what you're doing with the business is you have now extended it beyond um, life stories for individuals and you're now yep. capturing their business stories as well, which uh, just pure genius because what you sell is now tax deductible and I <laughs> <Yeah>. like that. <laughs> Who doesn't like that? <laughs> love a tax deduction. Um, so is this for any any of your clients that have run their own businesses or is this anyone where you just cover their, their business story as well? Well, it, it sort of came about through that story in Perth because they ended up being all about the business when it was meant to be all about the family, but their their business was their life. You know, the whole family were involved. And again, I don't mention names or the industry, but mm -hmm. these people were seriously wealthy and had an amazing story, you know, the immigrant coming to Australia and all this. And the idea was born from that because I thought, you know, if I just did a highlights clip, this would be great for their website. And even though they had just sold the business, they were still using the company they who bought it still wanted to attribute the heritage. So gave them a highlights clip. And I thought, well, we should be doing this for a lot of the clients we talk to because most of the people I'm talking to have at some stage had, you know, their own businesses. And so I started to approach a few people that were in business and, I would tell them about it. In fact, I picked up a few stories, uh, a few um, jobs just because they said, 
uh, yeah, we'd love to do it, but, um, and one of them said, but my mum's, uh, unfortunately, she's got an illness and I'd love to get her story down first. So can we do that? And then we'll talk about doing the business one. Mm-hmm. Well, it was a family business. So we've, the mum talked about uh, their business that they're currently running. So again, we were able to take some highlights for that for them to use on their website. And that ended up all going through the business then because they were getting the, uh, the benefit of it, of course. Uh, and so we've done that now with quite a few people where we tell their story and because, you know, at the end of the day, if you've got a, a great business and you might be approaching retirement or you may not be, but by shooting your life story mm. and we can extract out the, I guess, uh, the story behind the, the business uh, because we've all got normally a, a great story to tell and the sacrifices you make and because uh, a lot of people see people driving around in a flash car and go, aren't they lucky and all that, but they forget. Mm-hmm. Like when I started my old business, I used to make a can of baked beans last three days with a loaf of bread because <laughs> I had to pay staff, but I couldn't pay myself. And <laughs> I, I used to, I remember on day two, if I went past the, you know, as I was hungry, I, I, oh, God, if I can't eat too much, I won't have enough for tomorrow's yeah. dinner. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And seriously, that's how desperate I got at the very beginning. So and that's what I was saying about when I started this business, I, I treat it that way. But the whole point to all this is to that most people who have successful businesses have had to hustle, have had to graft, they've had to do all sorts of things to get it rolling. But the best marketing strategy for a lot of businesses now is to communicate with their clients and be real and be personable and so if you're, we would rather deal with a company, soulless companies, no one really wants to buy from. Mm. Like, you know, your car dealers, if you'd be more likely to buy from the local car dealer if you know he's, you know, a local resident and he's this and he's that and he's, he's got a, a profile as opposed to a big chain that has mm. no soul and it's just, you know, a widget factory, so to speak. So video communicates really well. If you're looking at a website, you're looking for some sort of, validation which we all do now if we're looking for anything we go to google you hit the website and if you can see the owner of the company uh talking about the struggles and and the highs and and they're proud of their company you feel good about it so you want to buy off them and i think that's a terrific sort of thing for the for the client but it also is giving back to their family because they end up getting the whole story as well we're chatting with Tony Knight, who is the founder of This Is My Life. Tony, pricing. How, how do you go about pricing okay. what you the, do? Yeah, well, the, we, have, we used to have four different packages. It basically comes down to two now as um, the basic offering, and that is the movie only. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually runs for about an hour. Uh, we have hundreds of photos that we restore and all that, and that starts at around six grand, including GST. Uh, the and that if you uh, think about it too, it's I mean it's a very professional setup. We've, we've as you know the cinema, and I'd encourage everyone mm-hmm. to have a walkthrough tour on our website and see what we've set up with a private cinema and so forth. Pretty impressive. Thank you. Um, and then it goes through to the 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 biggest package we have, which is what everyone seems to go for. Uh, that's now twelve grand, including GST, and that mm-hmm. is all the filming as per the other movie, but it's the full album with all the photos printed in there in this beautiful uh, case with all the Blu-ray, DVD and USBs and Mm. so on and so on. So between 6 to 12 is where we sort of sit. We did have a a much cheaper package to get people in at the start, but um, we just couldn't tell their story in in that time frame. So I'm just honest with people now and I tell them, I don't do it anymore because we have to do justice to your story. And the stats are that over 80% of the people we film have all gone for the bigger package but started with the smallest one. Nice. Because once they're invested, they're, they're right in. They see the value. Tony, it's an absolute uh, pleasure to speak to someone who absolutely loves what they do. Uh, I think what you do is, is incredibly interesting. Um, thanks for tuning into my show uh, for so long. And for anyone listening, and there's plenty of business owners out there listening, go to thisismylife.com.au and uh, and get do- Tony to uh, document your life, dare I say, before it's too late. Tony, love your work. Thanks, mate. Well, thank you, Tim, and thank you for the podcast in all seriousness.
Well, there you go. This is your life's Tony Knight. I do love interviewing long-time listeners. It sort of makes my heart sing, knowing that he's sort of been listening all those years and now he gets to be a guest on the show. I love that. Coming up, this week's Monster Prize Draw winner explains how a $100 outlay returned him $10,000 of business. It's not a bad ROI. But right now, here's what grabbed my attention from chatting with Tony. Attention grabber number one. I think there's a great lesson in what Tony shared about knowing when it's time to get out of what you're doing if you don't like it and chase down something that will set your heart on fire. So if you've got a business that's not setting your heart on fire, maybe it's time to kind of hand the keys over and chase down something that will. Attention grabber number two. I love how Tony sought some PR on radio station 3AW down in Melbourne, a perfect demographic for what he has to offer. And I do think he should consider taking up some advertising on that station. If you want to hear of a business owner that did that, and this is not this is not an ad for 3AW, by the way, but have a listen to the episode. I'll put a link in the show notes. My chat with Dan Presser from Sunraysia Prune Juice. He talks about how he's created these cringeworthy ads that he ran on uh, Talkback Radio and built two, not one, but two multi-million dollar FMCG brands. Attention grabber number three. I love how Tony actively sought out some training on search engine optimization. It shows his respect for marketing. Although, I've got to say, if you can afford to pay someone else to do that, I'd prefer you to actually do that and spend more time uh, in other aspects of your business. Um, I'm going to actually have an episode uh, coming up in the coming weeks about outsourcing, about um, you know getting a virtual assistant and other people from other parts of the world to work with you on your business. That is to come. That's what grabbed my attention. Whatever grabbed yours, be sure to block out some time and implement it. It's Timbo's Monster Prize Draw. Oh, yes, indeed, doodly. It's time to reward another motivated business owner and listener for taking some serious marketing action. And today's winner is... Nicholas Payton of Plateau Electrical. And this is what Nicholas has to say. He says, hey, Timbo. G'day, Nick. Absolutely love your show. I run Plateau Electrical, a small electrical contracting business in Sydney. Your podcast has been such a source of ideas and inspiration, so thank you. We've been putting lots of bits and pieces from the show into practice, but one of the key takeaways was your interview with Josh Nichols of Platinum electricians. Ah, Very similar names there, uh, young Nicholas. He talked about creating a customer experience that people would talk about over dinner to their friends. He mentioned he achieved things uh, this with things like movie vouchers. Yeah, he did. That was a, it was a pretty popular episode. As I keep mentioning, Josh had created a 21-step customer manifesto. Nicholas says, at the time of listening to the podcast, I was working for this lovely lady who had been referred to us by a friend from a tennis club. Both clients were heavily involved in the social community circles and on completion of the job, I sent each of them a double pass for gold movie tickets. From that small outlay, 100 bucks, they went on to refer us another $10,000 in business among their friends, all of who came to us raving about our business before we'd even work for them. Cheers for doing what you do. You're a legend, Timbo. Cheers, Nicholas Payton from plateauelectrical.com.au. Nicholas, well done for you, brother, for implementing those ideas. As a result, you win a $75 flora and fauna voucher, $50 sandal voucher, a Lumber Punks $100 voucher. You can go and throw some axes indoors. Boxing gloves from Fitness Enhancement, Liars range of non-alcoholic spirits worth over 500 bucks, an eight-pack of Mr. Lee's noodles, access to Jeff Anderson's video marketing course, a $100 voucher to go and buy some tradies undies. You get promotion on this show and a backlink in the show notes. That's a lot, right? Just for emailing me. That's over a thousand bucks worth of prizes. Everyone else, if you've implemented an idea from listening to this show, just email me, tim at timreed, R-E-I-D dot com dot A-U, 
and let me know what you've done. If I read it out on air, you win. All righty, before we wrap things up, just a reminder that you'll find plenty more where this came from, plus my entire archive full of ideas to grow that beautiful business of yours is over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. If you're getting value from listening, don't keep the podcast a secret. Be sure to let other business owners know about it. They'll thank you, and so will I. Next week, we catch up with Marx Acosta Rubio. Now, he's a fellow who grew up in the slums of Venezuela, but has gone on to become a Decker millionaire, selling ink cartridges over the phone. Amazing. And boy, oh boy, does he share his business and marketing insights so generously. This podcast was presented by me, Timbo Reed, produced by Matt Dwyer. Until next week, thanks for tuning in. Now get out there and take action. <laughs>